situation compared to the externalities, which is that um, the decision in many of these cases is quite simple. So compared to the externality thing where you have to figure out exactly how much of the externality, here it's usually a decision like do we build this thing or not. So that simplifies things significantly. Uh, second, um, often for public goods, what, in some sense almost what we mean by public goods, as I said before, is that individuals have significant information about whether this is the right thing to do or not. So think about the example of eminent domain, right? You, as someone who's a property owner, know a lot about how willing you are to move. And it's really important that as we make our decision about whether to build the mall or not, we get input from you about how uh, costly it is for you to move, right? And there's a very large number of individuals involved. So in these settings, what we often do is none of these three things. What we often do is voting to decide uh, what, what we're going to do. So everyone receives some weight. So what do I mean by voting? So the simplest form of voting, right, is just that everybody gets a single vote and the majority rules. But more broadly, we can give different weights to different people, right? And then if the sum over all the people who are in favor of their weights is above some threshold, we can approve or not. So that threshold might be two-thirds, like in the Senate, right, uh, for many things. Uh, or it could be lower, it could be, you know, 30% of people need to approve. And, you know, I could give more weight to people who own more shares in a corporation, right? Um, but, but that's sort of the general idea of voting, right? So, um, let's think about how voting is as a way to make a social decision. So, again, let's suppose that everyone has the same share uh, and the same number of votes and that we have IID valuations, right? So ideally what we'd like is that if the sum of everyone's values is greater than the cost, that we'd like to build the project, right? Um, another way of putting that is that the average value that people have is greater than their share of the cost, C over N. Right? Um, so when does this pass under voting? Well, under voting, it will pass if a majority of people, or a plurality, you know, if we're not going to, it could be two-thirds, it could be, you know, one-third, it could be whatever, but, but some threshold up in favor of it, right? But notice that this is not determined by whether the average person values it more, but rather by whether the median person, or the ex-quantile person, values it more, right? <laughs> it's... So it will get a majority of votes if half of the, if at least half of the people have values that are above their cost, rather than if the average person has a value above the cost, right? And so that means that in order to design the right voting rule, we need to know what quantile of the distribution corresponds to the mean of the distribution, right? And that can often be hard for the government to know. Um, perhaps we can guess. Uh, and this is sort of the principle on the basis of which we should set different thresholds in different voting situations, right? The reason why we set the, you know, threshold higher for things like constitutional amendments, I would guess, is that we think that the median may be well above the mean for constitutional changes. So we think that there may be like a big left tail of the distribution. Some people are really harmed by changes to the Constitution, right? And so we want to reduce the chances of that happening unless the, we're in a state of the world where the distribution is really high. Um, so, um, why does voting fail to give us, you know, the efficient outcome? Well, basically the problem is people in voting can say, yes, I approve, or no, I don't approve, but they can't really show how much they care, right? If people could say, no, not only am I in favor of this, but I'm really in favor of this, or no, I'm not just opposed to this, but I think this is just horrible, right? Then we could take into account quantitatively how much people care. But because we can't do that, 
the, the voting rule is based on this median thing rather than on the mean, which we want it to be based on. Yeah, Terrence. Sure, but it was quantitatively run into the same problem system. It would. Yeah, exactly. So that's the problem. So because of these problems, we can't put in the quantitative information. We're forced to use only this ordinal information, but what we really care about is the cardinal information. Um, and <laughs> this problem gets much worse when we move beyond deciding between two things and have to choose among many. Because when we're just deciding among two things, well, then at least maybe the median is somewhere near the mean. But if we're deciding among many, well, like trying to figure out how to rank all these different things, right? And yet all we know is sort of how people, what order people put in them. And that's like not very useful information. So let me give you a, an example of that. So imagine that we're voting on three candidates, A, B, and C, right? And imagine that one third of people rank A, then B, then C. One third of people rank B, then C, then A. And then the other third of people rank C, then A, then B. So who should win in this case? Well, one way that you can think about it is looking at the pairwise majority winners. That is, imagine that there are any pair of candidates ran against one another, who would win? Um, and Shin, um, who would win if A ran against B in this case? And we did a majority vote. Um, then, uh, A could win. Because yeah. um, in the first and third vote, A is uh, B. Exactly. B would win one vote, A would win two votes. Right. Now, if B ran against C, who would win? Great. And what if C and A ran against each other? Who would win? C would win because C is the end of the last <laughs> That's a little bit of a problem, isn't it? <laughs> um, so A beats B, B beats C, but then C beats A, right? So who should win? And the answer is there's really no answer. I mean, there's just, I mean, all these guys are equally good in some sense, right? So this is called Condorcet's paradox. And it implies that any system for deciding in this case is going to be pretty arbitrary. So to make that a little bit more formal, imagine that we want a, a system to satisfy some basic properties. First of all, imagine that everyone prefers A over B, then we think society should prefer A over B. Right? Second of all, we want to say that adding an extra option C to the system doesn't change the ranking that we put of A over B. If A was beating B, adding C doesn't change anything. And third, um, the system should work for any set of rankings that people submit. So these sound like really reasonable conditions, right? But it turns out that Arrow in 1951 showed a very powerful result, uh, depressing result, based on these conditions, which is that the only ranking system uh, satisfying these properties makes one citizen a dictator over all the other citizens. That is, the only system that you can do if there are at least three people and at least three options uh, is one that makes one person uh, preferences determine everything. Okay, so what this leads us to is that we have to trade off uh, a range of evils in making social decisions, right? So one tool we can use is expert analysis. And Bill, what are some of the pros and cons of that? Um, well, the pros, obviously, is that you have someone, you have people that know a lot about the area that you're talking yeah. about. So the cons are that um, the decisions made by a small group of people, so maybe, although they were trying to take into account the whole thing. I don't know, but I don't know what the cons Yeah, well, so I mean, I think the benefits are that it allows expertise, it allows people to think really carefully and soberly about the issue, and often the experts have the right incentives. Actually, maybe a con would be 
like in the Friedman example, if there's like an incentive problem, like the experts making the decision have some incentive to like make a decision that's better for them and not for the. So, so that's one real possibility, but and, and th that that's really important. I think also at least is important is that um, if we're trying to decide about whether to build, you know, the factory or the bridge or whatever. It's really hard for an expert to know how much you value your land, right? And it's also really hard for an expert to know how much you value having a new bridge that can let you get to your work more quickly. Uh, because you might just value that in some very particular way, or you might value the view that you get from the bridge in some very particular way of your own, right? And so it's going to leave out any information that is individual, that comes from individual people, right? So that's the major con, as well as the problem that the experts might manipulate things. Um, second option is the Vickery Clark Rose mechanism. And Mike, what are the pros and cons of the Vickery Clark Rose mechanism? Um, um, so like an efficient outcome. Yeah. Because the people respond to their, the value that they yeah. have. But at the same time, you can have issues uh, and problems with people working together. Yeah, absolutely. So the benefit is that. It efficiently incorporates everyone's information. That's good. But the problem is that it's totally impractical. It, it requires you burn all the money that's collected from the system. And it is really vulnerable to collusion. So in practice, it's never going to work. So that sucks. Um, how about voting? Emily, what did we just say were the pros and cons of voting? Voting doesn't give us time Yeah. But what are the, what's the benefit of it? The benefit is that it's a lot easier to do and people are less likely to lie. Well, actually, yeah. like, you still lie in certain voting systems. Yeah. But, but, it, but it, it gives us a way to incorporate people's, um, it gives us a way to incorporate people's information, the, the subjective information they have, um, without running into all the messy problems of VCG. Uh, maybe the only way to do that. Uh, but it has at best a weak relationship to efficiency because it doesn't give us cardinal information yet. Yeah, uh, does voting lend itself to uh, factions and like special interest groups that could uh, harm the general public? Um, I mean, I think it depends. I think the, the broader, the more people you require to vote, like the higher threshold you have, the less that that happens. But on the higher threshold you have, the more you run into the unanimity problem. So. <laughs> So it has sort of trade-offs, but, but yeah, that's right. Um, so I think that in practice, what we really do in our society, uh, or what seems optimal, is to combine systems one and three. System two seems very impractical. Uh, systems one and three both have problems, but probably uh, work best if combined. And what sort of system of state what sort of system of government do you think combines uh, expertise and deliberation with, with voting? Well, in practice, none of them really, but I guess in <laughs> theory, representative. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sort of the idea of representative democracy, right, is that you have people put it, giving their input in terms of the things where it really depends on their individual preferences, and at sort of a broad level, right, on simple issues, the areas where voting is the strongest. And then you have a bunch of experts who they've sort of selected make a lot of decisions about more detailed things uh, and so forth. Yeah, Ben? That just reminds me of like kind of like Iran's government, where like you have like the council of, uh, I forget what it's called, but they like approve like a slate of people to vote for. So you have the experts giving people the options and the people choose the options. Well, I mean, I think every system has some, every representative system has some like that. I think a lot would argue, people would argue that it's better if it's the other way around, if the experts are chosen by the voting or something. But like kind that, of like right? discredits their expertise, right? Like, what's the point yeah. of having an expert? Like, like who determines the expert, right? If the people are doing it, they're not really experts. Like, well. Like, is a senator really an expert on anything? Well, that's, that, to some extent, that's true. Uh, unfortunately, but at least the principle behind representative yeah. democracy. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, in some sense, what we've done is given sort of an economic account of like why 